Hi, my name's Chris Chaplin. I'm a embedded technology specialist for Intel in the UK. Just want to take a moment to thank the Linux Foundation, uh, first of all, for inviting me. Um, I was very much looking forward to to joining everyone in, in Austin, Texas, as I'm sure we all um, were. It wasn't to be, unfortunately, this time, but yeah, really appreciate that they um, have arranged this to be a virtual event uh, so that we can still um, have some great discussions and, and hopefully we'll continue to do that. Along that line, I will be looking at the chat um, at the end of this presentation. Um, I'm not sure if I'll be able to look at it when going along, um, but I'll, I'll leave some time at the end to hopefully answer any of your questions. So the title of this presentation is um, The Bad Guys Just Broke My Crypto and What Do I Do Now? So let's get on with that. Now, when we think about secure communications, really that's about protecting our data in some way. And usually what we would use is encryption and authentication um, to protect our data. And there's really things that, that we're trying to protect against. So first of all, we're trying to protect our data against interception um, and the abuse that may follow from that. So, for example, we don't want our communications between two secure endpoints to, to be in any way circumvented or, or violated. Um, and the abuse that could follow with that would be um, stealing the information. Um, and also unauthorized access. So we don't want um, a, a bad guy or, or a criminal, a bad person to um, have unauthorized access to our systems. And so we use both um, encryption and authentications as really pillars in order to, to give us that kind of security. Now, in the domestic environment, we're looking at things such as uh, banking, um, personal data. Yeah, we're using uh, crypto technologies constantly, day in day out, in order to to secure our uh, environment. You know, especially for for confidential information, um, and as well, location information as well is is really important. So, really, we're seeing day in day out uh, an increase in the amount of. Um, uh, secure communications that are happening. Um, just from the the web, we'll see that um, quite often we'll have a, an HTTPS connection uh, where we never had one before. So constantly security is, is increasing um, in our personal environments. Moving on to the industrial environment, uh, we're seeing connected factories becoming far more uh, common. Um, you know, the, there's a big revolution that, that's been going on in the last few years on this. As well, safety systems, uh, machine automation, auditing, um, and uptime. These are all big requirements um, in the industrial communications, and we use um, strong cryptography and, and state-of-the-art uh, authentication techniques to to enable that. Moving into medical, uh, you can imagine the amount of information that's available in in medical environments. So um, confidentially confidentiality of you know, personal records and reports, uh, the authentication of users and reliability of data is, is really important in those fields. And then in automotive as well, um, we're seeing with the rollout of, of 5G, um, the connected vehicle becoming absolutely critical um, and the security around that is really important as well. Uh, again, anti-theft, you know, tracking, safety systems, they all require um, a le level of sophistication as far as authentication um, and encryption in order for those systems to, to work reliably. Now, really, there's a big challenge with um, anything to do with security, and that's really keeping constant. You know, keeping constant uh, is always a challenge, and it's always a case that um, there's a, a natural conflict between um, the, the bad people and the good people as far as uh, up-to-date software. We, we know that, and we've seen that uh, constantly across um, across the industry. And really, I think security is not something that you can say is ever done. Um, it's a, a process that continues to happen. You know, a system that's considered state-of-the-art and secure um, today may well in just a few months' time be considered so badly uh, vulnerable that it really can't be recommended for use. And so we have this evolution of security that's constantly going, and we can see that right the way back in time. I mean, if you look at things such as Wi-Fi, now Wi-Fi um, had an, an original original standard called WEP, Wired Equivalent Privacy. And the idea behind that was you know, the privacy of that connection was so good um, that it was the equivalent of being a, a wired connection. Now, of course, we know uh, today, um, based on the research and, and um, 
and, and intrusions that have happened in that time um, that WEP is completely broken and it's really trivial with today's tools in order to, to break that kind of encryption. And so, as I say, it's a case of constantly needing to keep adapting and keeping up to date, you know, following what's happening in the industry and, and best practices to see uh, exactly how we can ensure that this thing you know, remains secure over the course of time. Now, looking at the Linux kernel, just in the um, lib crypto directory, for example, just taking a quick git log on here, there's not loads of churn, uh, as we can see. I mean, there's, there's not a great deal of, of active development going on at any particular moment in time. But my point is that there is still change happening. You know, there's, there's things that are being found. You know, maybe these aren't big things. Maybe these are more um, error checking and, and those kind of things. But we're never quite done with security. And so we need to take that into account um, when we're, we're looking at security systems. It's only as secure as someone keeping them up to date. Now, when we're looking at cryptography, one of the things that we can probably start with are the, the different kinds of cryptography that we use. And one of the most um, powerful things that's widely used is either public key cryptography uh, or asymmetric cryptography. Now, the great thing about um, public key asymmetric cryptography is that it relies on um, something that's mathematically very easy to do in one direction and very difficult to do in the opposite direction. So for example, um, in uh, public key cryptography, effectively you have um, two numbers, we'll call them P and Q. Uh, these are large uh, prime numbers uh, that are calculated by a system. And those are multiplied together uh, to create a um, a uh, value, uh, the product of those terms, n. And so P and Q, the, the prime numbers that, that, that are multiplied together, those are kept secret, and those are known as the, the private key. Um, and the, the large number that's the result of multiplying the two together um, is uh, given out as the public key. And what's absolutely amazing, I think, about this particular technology is that we can uh, give out the public key to anyone that we want, um, and they have no... Uh, mathematical way of, of trivially being able to get back to the secret key. So we can quite easily prove that um, we're the owner of a certain piece of information. We can use this function to sign something um, and then um, someone at the other end can authenticate that that information indeed did come from us if they've got their, their private, uh, their, the public key that comes with that. So as I say, finding P and Q um, from N is very computationally difficult. Now, when it comes to a very small number, a very small prime, then you can use a brute force method to, to, to get this information and it can be quite straightforward. But then um, getting you know, up to bigger and bigger and much larger um, prime numbers, um, very quickly that becomes pretty much impossible um, with today's technology um, in order to, to derive that and to find that. So finding N from P and Q is very straightforward. Going the opposite direction is, is very difficult. Now, one technology that, that uses this uh, is RSA. Um, that's a, a very classic um, technology for, for public key crypto. Um, and ECDSA um, uses alternative approaches um, using curves to, to kind of link between public and, and private keys. But they'll work on a similar principle of, of kind of one-way functions uh, in order to get this um, system up and running. Something that was really interesting was that the RSA that created the RSA asymmetric cryptography um, algorithm, they put together a factorizing challenge. Now we know that smaller numbers um, are easier to factorize uh, methodically than, than larger numbers. Um, and so they started in, in 1991 um, with a series of, um, of, of um, outputs from the RSA algorithm, and then they gave cash prizes for those people that could factorize them. So as you can see on the on the table here, they started off with the um, the smallest number, uh, RSA 100, not exactly small, uh, contained uh, 330 binary digits, 100 um, decimal digits, and they were offering cash prizes that increased in in value depending on the the size of the RSA number. So you can see the the different cash prizes that were offered um, up to uh, two hundred thousand um, dollars for RSA in twenty forty eight. So this um, this started in nineteen ninety one and finished in two thousand and seven. And just looking through this list, you can see um, quite clearly that uh, in nineteen ninety one and um, 
on April the first, the the first um, prime number was um, or, or the first pair of prime numbers was successfully factorized um, by by Lenstrom Co. And you can see the same names kind of working through some of these numbers throughout the the course of time. And then you can see um, as things progress, as the numbers get um, bigger, you know, they can still be factorized, but they take um, more and more time to do so. Now, as you can see, um, the, the cash prizes were, were stopped in 2007. Uh, that hasn't stopped people continuing to work on this. You can see uh, dates in 2009, 2010, 2013, 2018, um, as we go up the, um, the factorizing um, sizes for, for different RSA uh, keys. And obviously that's because um, it takes a lot more compute power. Uh, it takes a lot more um, energy to factorize these numbers and computers are increasing over time. So our ability to, uh, to break these numbers continues to increase over time. So looking at um, this particular example um, from Thorsten Kleinjung and, and uh, colleagues in 2009, they were able to break RSA 768, so a 768 uh, binary digit um, uh, factorization. Now, at that time, uh, in 2009, um, their computation power was such that they were using a, a load of resources, uh, the equivalent of 2,000 uh, years of computing on a single 2.2 gigahertz AMD Opteron, um, 2 to the 67 instructions to carry this out. So even though it was possible uh, to factorize RSA 768, um, whatever that was, 11 years ago, um, it took a lot of resources in order to do that. Now we are seeing Moore's law continuing uh, to a certain extent, maybe not at the rate it was before, computer, computing power and um, the ability to do multi-core processing does continue to a certain extent to rise over time. But we can see that this is a, a problem that gets increasingly harder to do the larger the, um, the, larger the number. Now, Taking into account the, the RSA numbers here, the, these 768-bit key, for example, now it's not the case that if you had a 1500-bit key, um, that that's twice as difficult to factorize. No, in actual fact, every, um, every few bits or almost every bit of increase in the size of a factor um, increases the complexity by two. Uh, it's, a, it's a binary um, representation. So the larger the key gets, the, the exponentially larger, almost exponentially larger, uh, it is as a challenge to factorize these things. And so we can see over time, um, you know, it used to be commonplace that people would have 1,024-bit uh, keys or uh, maybe 512-bit keys a long time ago. Um, but really, the the move is to to push up the the size because certainly these these keys are not considered, you know, the smaller keys are not considered uh, to be safe at this time. And that's what we see with cryptography. We see um, a constantly changing battlefield um, as. Uh, new techniques come along um, as the increasing computing power becomes greater um, it becomes more and more likely that these smaller key sizes are just not secure anymore. Now there is another way to factorize numbers back into their prime um, multiples and that is using an algorithm um, named after a mathematician uh, Peter Shaw which he and his colleagues have come up with. Um, now, the first part of this algorithm um, is a classical part that can be performed on a, uh, a PC, on a server, and that's really picking a random number, computing a greatest common divisor, and then checking to see if it's a, a non-trivial factor. The, the second part as well, the, the second step, uh, sorry, the third step um, can also be performed on a, a classical computer, checks to see if R is odd, um, does some other maths, and then finds out whether um, the, the answers are, are non-trivial uh, sorry, um, factors of n, uh, and so we're done on that. But the middle piece of this um, is quite interesting, and that uses um, something called a quantum period finding subroutine, and this requires a quantum computer in order to achieve this. Now, the complexity of the quantum computer required in order to find this particular section of the, the factorization uh, goes up in complexity deciding, uh, depending on the, the size of the factor that it's trying to find. So that kind of begs the question, how are we doing with the factorization of prime numbers using quantum computers? Well, that's um, really um, quite interesting. And we'll look back in time, first of all. So in 2001, um, a quantum computer was, of th yeah, the, the top quantum computer was able to factorize uh, 15 into 3 times 5. 
So something that we would see, see as pretty trivial on a um, on a PC today, or in fact at any time. In 2012, um, there was some progress made. Um, the factorization of 21 and 143 were also um, achieved. 2014, you can see the numbers are starting to get a tiny bit bigger. Uh, still pretty trivial uh, for today's machines. 2016, um, again, uh, an important um, improvement, but something that's really rather a small number compared to the size of numbers that we're talking about with 1024, 2048-bit keys. So 2017, 2018, IBM, Intel and Google each reported uh, testing quantum computers containing um, up to 72 qubits. And a qubit is a measure of the, um, the sophistication and the capacity of a quantum computer. Now, quantum computers aren't things where you can have two quantum computers side by side to double the, the capacity. Uh, this all needs to be in, in one, um, one single unit. And then 2019, um, IBM launched a, um, a, another computer as well um, for uh, 20 qubits uh, as well. So at the moment, we're quite a way away um, from the, the sophistication of something that could break a even a 1024-bit key. So a 1024-bit key is predicted would take about 2,000 qubits uh, of, um, of quantum compute performance in order to be able to crack. So compared to the, the 72 qubits um, from, from Google, um, there's still a way to go on that. So when looking at this kind of challenge, um, the question is, when would, should we start to worry? Yeah, should we start to worry at all? And there's different um, opinions on, on this. So uh, as you would imagine, uh, Dr. Mark Jackson, um, a theoretical physicist, suggested a few years ago now that we could be five years away. Um, we've got the source for that as well. What I found very interesting is the NSA, uh, in some of their documentation on um, on quantum computing, have suggested that they're moving away um, from technologies that could be defeated by uh, quantum computers. And they suggest that this might arise within a couple of decades. Um, and so for their new technology that's coming in, they put requirements on, uh, on their vendors to be able um, to um, be quantum secure now uh, and ready for, for a few decades time. Uh, as you probably know, military equipment as well as industrial equipment can be around for, for several decades. And so they're looking now at that being a potential risk. OK, so let's bound this a bit more. So as you are aware, there's different types of secret and there's different types of information that we're trying to protect. So some data are only going to have short term value. So, for example, a session cookie for an online banking session, that's something that expires you know, with a pretty short time window of maybe you know, less than an hour, for example. You know, the password from a token generator, again, something that may only last a couple of minutes you know, before um, it's no longer able to be used. Um, you know, predictions for financial markets, a daily rotated key, all these kind of things may necessarily only have short term value. So when we're looking at time scales such as five years or 20 years, yeah, maybe these are not the things that we really need to be concerned about now um, as far as um, encryption being broken. But then if we look at other things such as medical records, yeah, the credentials of Bitcoin wallets that, that may be encrypted and put somewhere, maybe not quite safe enough. Um, username and passwords, social security numbers. There is certain types of secret um, that may well have um, a lot more long-term value. Yeah, maybe some of these um, these bits of, uh, of information may well have extremely long-term value, uh, such as those that the NSA are perhaps worried about uh, protecting in the longer term. And so you can see here um, private crypto keys as well as all other kinds of things. So I think it is important to differentiate between the types of secret that we may wish to be protecting against. So how seriously should we take the threat of quantum computing? Well, certainly I've, I've drawn a graph here to try and indicate my thoughts on this. I've got the, the lifespan of a product in, in years and then the longevity of the, the value of the data um, in, in years on the, on the bottom graph here. So if we've got a, um, a product that is going to be in the lifespan of the market for a long time, 10, 20 years, maybe some industrial products, and the longevity of the value of the data um, is also um, pretty high, then we're really in a system where we should probably go to market with quantum secure cryptography. There's an uncertainty period, as you can see here. Um, and then a device that's either very short in the market um, 
or has data and has data that uh, doesn't have any real longevity of value, um, that's something that we can certainly use traditional cryptography with confidence um, as, as it is today. Um, and so depending on the kinds of data and the length that a product is in the market for, we have different ideas as to how worried we need to potentially be, depending on whether we uh, believe the, the five-year mark or the 20-year mark as far as uh, quantum cryptography um, goes. So the question really becomes, what do we do with products that are falling right in the middle of that range? Now, two approaches can be taken. So we can, first of all, implement post-quantum algorithms today. There's certainly a series of, of algorithms that we'll, we'll briefly touch over and decide on the most likely algorithm, yeah, looking forwards, um, looking for the information that we have today, which is the li most likely algorithm to have longevity over the, the lifetime of the product. So that's something that you could certainly do. Uh, there's lots of research going on in, into this area um, and that's something that you would need to, to look at if you're worried about quantum being a threat. The other idea, and probably something that um, happens more um, more frequently, is that you could go to the market with traditional security, the security that we're all um, familiar with, um, ECDSA, for example, with different curves. And then the aim would be that if and when quantum does become a threat, yeah, maybe it does, maybe it doesn't, but in the future, then we can use a field update um, to update the product and, you know, cross that bridge when it comes to it as far as um, quantum security requirements are concerned and become more tangible as, a, as an issue. Now the trouble with going to market with a quantum secure algorithm is really um, one of time I think. Um, now traditional cryptography is really well understood uh, and it's really been um, studied in great detail by mathematicians um, over the years. You know, things have um, evolved over time, um, such as Diffie-Hellman Key Exchange, RSA, ECDSA with different curves. These have all been um, a, a very slow evolution that's been very carefully um, controlled and uh, looked at by researchers. And so there are newer standards um, that are considered to be quantum safe, but really safety is only something that can be um, defined over a period of time. Uh, and as you know, today, we don't actually have quantum um, computers that are uh, of sufficient um, sophistication to break um, traditional cryptography. And so there may well need to be some changes um, made in, in the future. So really, yeah, taking back that original um, argument I had about um, about security over time, we don't know quite enough about these new standards to really um, have them proven in use. Yeah, there could be potentially other things that we've not yet thought of um, that could cause um, you know, these different kinds of cryptography to be um, uh, less secure than we, we first expect. So we should be really cautious, uh, as we should do with everything to do with security and um, encryption, just to make sure that these things have been extremely well tested. And, and they are, you know, they're going through a lot of uh, research and a lot of um, standards are being developed as we speak. And there's lots of uh, standards that we can choose from as far as um, uh, post-quantum secure uh, cryptography are concerned. Another really important consideration is that of the, the CPU performance. As we know, um, symmetric cryptography functions such as, as AES have been around for, for quite a long time. And so what's happened over the years is that the, the vendors of, of different CPUs across the, the industry from, from ARM, Intel, PowerSpark, AMD, you'll look at all of those um, architectures and the developers have created cryptographic extensions to the instruction set specifically to speed up these kinds of instructions. And so within the instruction set of the devices, we already have these building blocks. Now, if we move to um, a different kind of cryptography, as we have with, um, with current CPU technology, we wouldn't necessarily be able to use those same crypto building blocks in order to um, accelerate those functions. Now, this could be um, a challenge when it comes to, to some of these standards because we would take um, effectively a, a performance hit. So this could be um, an inability to, uh, at runtime, uh, have the same kind of bandwidth of encryption uh, that we were expecting with um, with previous traditional, if you like, um, cryptogra cryptographic functions. 
or it could well be that the the CPU performance would be degraded and we wouldn't be able to do so many other things um, at the same time simply because it would take um, a proportion more of the CPU's performance in order to uh, adapt to using these different um, cryptographic techniques. So how do we really cope um, with deciding how algorithms should be implemented when the standards effectively could be changing over the lifetime of the product? Now, this is a challenge that um, quite often happens. You know, standards are evolving. We don't wait until all the standards are uh, are set for, for every aspect of design prior to needing to ship a product. Now, as I said, tra uh, traditional CPUs are, are fantastic at accelerating current cryptographic standards. You know, those standards have been around a while. Um, a lot of them are based around matrix manipulation. And so the the hardware features required to, to really perform a good job um, across those devices have been in dedicated hardware and there's there's compiler support for those um, and that's been pretty mature over the years. But if a device is in the field, you know, it's out in production, it's out with uh, with your customers and you need to move to a new standard, you know, be that um, a quantum secure standard, be that a change um, based on a, a new vulnerabilities that found you could effectively uh, come across a bit of a challenge um, and it could well be that the existing acceleration, the existing instruction sets, which are absolutely essential to, to run at speed and to continue the performance of your device, they may no longer be used in this new change that you make uh, to your system. You know, odds are good that they would be able to be used. You know, If you've got a, a bug in the Linux kernel that is addressed based on a vulnerability, then continue to use you know, the standard crypto functions. But thinking long term ahead, you know, what could the, the challenges involve on there? So how do you adapt to acceleration to tomorrow's needs when we're designing today? I mean, we don't know what tomorrow is going to bring, really. You know, we've got a good idea, but then looking further ahead, standards evolve, um, accelerators may need to change, you know, especially if we'd make a big leap into a new form of cryptography sometime in the future. Now, when it comes to an evolving standard, when it comes to things changing that require hardware acceleration over time, um, quite often programmable logic can be an ideal solution. We already have programmable CPUs. Yeah, we can change the instruction set to the CPU or, or we can change the instructions given into the CPU by compiling new code. Programmable logic takes that a step further and that allows us to build um, accelerators that can change over the lifetime of the product as well. So programmable logic can be very scalable. There's there's lots of different places that it can be used. And this small, um, this small little rectangle here on a 0.1-inch uh, matrix board here is a, a discrete FPGA that could be integrated into a system um, to complement the process that you got in your design. So that could potentially take some some lightweight tasks uh, off of the processor to, to remove um, performance bottlenecks from that. In addition to that, um, there are uh, integrated devices from, from all the major vendors that, that provide uh, FPGA designs. Some of these have got um, ARM Cortex cores, uh, for example, in them. Um, I think this device has got a, a dual Cortex A9. There's also you know, larger devices from, from the, the major vendors for FPGAs out there. And the idea behind these devices is you have both um, a programmable um, logic device as well as a complete um, SOC all in the same package. And so the idea behind that is that when you take your accelerators, uh, for example, a, a crypto accelerator, you could start off using the AES engine in this, this Cortex A9, for example, uh, but should the performance requirements change over time, um, maybe you're moving to a new crypto standard, as, as we've suggested, um, then you could potentially move that function into the programmable logic, You know, take a, an, an open cores core um, off of the shelf for that at the time when the technology uh, exists, and then integrate that into your design, you know, give a new uh, update to the design uh, and move on with that. And then when, when we're talking about the real heavy lifting, the, the data center applications, I'm, I'm working a lot with you know, very high speed Ethernet um, uh, interfaces, for example. Then there's um, scalable solutions, again, from all vendors out there that, that support uh, FPGAs um, to provide PCI Express connections uh, to, to a server or, or so on to, to really have a high throughput of connection. 
So for example, if you're trying to um, encrypt data on a, a 10 gig or you know even faster uh, ethernet link, the likelihood is it will take up so much processing power on your um, on your um, server that yeah you need to offload that work. And so we have and others have classes of FPGAs that would uh, suit that kind of environment as well. So the questions of often asked um, and rightly so. Um, what if we don't really believe that quantum computers are a tangible threat? I mean, we we see all the time press releases about um, a new quantum computer coming out that has a certain level of sophistication. We hear scare stories about you know, quantum breaking crypto, but it always seems to be you know, no matter when you listen to to arguments and, and researchers about quantum computers you know, being a threat to crypto, it's always five years away and. It's been five years away for for many years now, and so evidently and, and arguably the the early predictions haven't necessarily come to become true. So if you're in a situation that every year it's five years away, you may be of the opinion, rightly so, that this is not something uh, that you need to worry about, and only time will tell really uh, if that's the case. So why don't we make a bit of a change here? Because I've been talking about um, crypto based on um, on quantum secureness but what if it's not the only scenario in which your crypto needs to change maybe in a fundamental way yeah we've been talking about the bad guys uh, breaking crypto you know arguably you know, some some state has got access to technology and your customers um, are trying to protect their technology against there but why don't we get rid of talking about the bad guys and get rid of talking about breaking crypto then make some different changes, see if that changes any of the concerns that we might have on, on this system. So what if I changed it to um, a nation state instead of the bad guys? Now, I'm, I'm not saying that nation states are bad guys, you know, far from it in many cases. Um, but what if the government decides um, that they might want to ban the crypto that you're currently using your device? You know, maybe this is another technique that we need to, to think about and mitigate throughout the lifetime um, of our systems and what do you do in that situation you know what what are the mitigating techniques that we can have if we predict that that may well be uh, a problem so this is a um, north american conference let's take uh, north america as an example first of all now william barr is the the u.s attorney general um, and he um, had a, a very interesting you know was, was part of a very interesting seminar on encryption technology and law enforcement uh, in 2019 last year I do recommend that you take a look at this um, this particular speech that he gave, as it really gives an insight as to the thinking and the, the challenges that the governments across the world have. And he was talking specifically about the the right to privacy. Um, now we're we're very keen as as individuals to um, to maintain the Fourth Amendment uh, in the U.S. And, and have a right to to privacy. Um, and he's talking about the the interpretation of that according to the um, to the U.S. Attorney General. And that really is about privacy not being absolute. So the challenge that um, the U.S. have, along with with other other governments around the world, is that there's certain circumstances where, you know, with due legal process and so on, um, the the law enforcement agencies require access um, to uh, information that is considered to be private. And he says that the Fourth Amendment strikes this balance between the rights for uh, conducting their affairs in private, but also the ability for law enforcement to um, investigate criminal activity. And he gives examples of um, you know, being able to gain a search warrant and then enter someone's home. You know, the home is a private place, um, but there is the ability for, with due process, the, the law uh, to take over on this and um, be able to encroach on that privacy over time. Now, you may wonder what this has got to do with um, encryption. Um, the, the interesting thing about encryption is that mathematics doesn't change depending on whether you have a search warrant or not. And so really, there's a, a challenge that the, the governments around the world are seeing as far as the implementation of the technology that we have today and then their ability to, um, to cause that to become circumvented uh, in the future. And you know, whilst we like that um, from a privacy perspective, you know, we, we have a feeling that privacy is absolute. It's interesting to see the other side of the coins and see the challenges that law enforcement uh, around the world are having on these. So if we take this uh, into the, the worldwide stage, 
there's been quite a lot of um, of, of public um, press around Facebook uh, and Facebook's um, proposal to implement end-to-end -end encryption across its mass messaging platform. So obviously this is the use of uh, strong uh, cryptography uh, using current standards in order to do this. And um, there was a there's an open letter from Priti Patel in the UK, William Barr, who we've just spoken from the Attorney General, um, Kevin McAllen and uh, Peter Dutton uh, in Australia, and they have put together an open letter to Facebook from from the, the UK, US, and Australian governments, proposing really that Facebook don't implement this. And this sounds really uh, bizarre, you know, from a, a first thought that you wouldn't want to have strong encryption uh, on personal messages to messages. Their argument is around the ability for, for automated processes to, to search for criminal activity. Uh, they use examples um, of uh, child protection schemes and so on um, that are using uh, these uh, automated techniques. And really, end-to-end um, -end encryption across uh, Facebook's messaging platforms will prevent um, the um, authorities from being able to perform this kind of encryption. As I said, it's great for the end user to have uh, a knowledge that end-to-end uh, -end encryption um, is you know, so robust that governments are, are concerned about it. You know, that, that gives a, a certain sense of, um, of, of, of happiness as far as you know, knowing that our communications are, are private. Um, but this does mean that policymakers and decision makers are really looking at ways of being able to mitigate this from a law enforcement perspective. Now, it's not just the attorneys generals that are getting in on the action in making proposals and concerns as far as end-to-end uh, -end encryption and uh, unbreakable you know, current uh, encryption. Um, there's a very interesting paper um, from Ian Levi and, and Crispin Robinson um, around encryption. And, and these uh, these people are from the, the GCHQ in the UK, the, the Government Communication Headquarters. And they were really talking about a proposal you know, for further debate. Um, of course, it got um, debunked um, or, or strongly opposed from, from others um, on proposal. But they were talking about the, the challenges around um, messaging protocols, you know, end-to-end -end encrypted messaging such as, as WhatsApp and, and how technology could be used uh, and proposed by um, law enforcement and governments uh, in order to be able to um, intercept and um, understand what's going on in, in a completely encrypted chat channel um, in the case that there's a, uh, a, law, a, a warrant uh, for information and the suspicion that a crime is being committed. And so they were recommending a protocol that's been coined the ghost protocol. Uh, and the idea behind that is that with a warrant, um, law enforcement could um, work with the service provider, uh, such as WhatsApp or uh, Facebook Messenger or, or so on, and then silently add an additional party to a call or to a, a group chat. And so there'd be um, this invisible additional member to the chat that's actually law enforcement. And so um, the way that group chat works is that um, any member of the group can decrypt the conversation. And so this would require changes to um, the, the user application and the, the API and the um, encryption methods that are being used for these group chats. But that would enable end-to-end um, -end encryption um, for bad guys, if you like, um, on the outside being able to intercept over the ISPs the chat, but also the ability for law enforcement agencies to um, intercept when they have a search warrant to do that. Now, it's important to state that this only really works for um, encrypted chat channels that um, are actually owned and managed by a company such as WhatsApp or, or Facebook Messenger. This, this doesn't in any way have an ability to intercept um, complete open source end-to-end -end encryption um, technologies that, that don't rely on, on a service provider. And the governments are, are well aware of this situation. Yeah, the, the horse has already bolted um, the barn. There's, there's no way to, to put control over cryptography. You know, people can use whichever encryption technique that they, they want. But when it comes to a commercial service, there, there's certainly things that they can do. And some of the arguments over this still being useful is around you know, the protection of minors, for example. You know, um, a lot of kids are, are using commercial um, messaging platforms such as 
the messaging in, in TikTok or um, Facebook or you know various other groups like WhatsApp. And these are all commercial platforms. And so if people or, or criminals are trying to um, get hold of information on those platforms, they don't have a choice. You know, they're using those platforms. And the idea behind the government's uh, requirements are to be able to intercept traffic you know, on those platforms. You know, they, they know that they will never be able to get 100 percent coverage of all systems, but that doesn't stop them wanting and, and proposing to try for, for those that can be controlled by, by policy and by law. So maybe that's a bit of a deviation from the, the quantum secure side of things, um, but it's kind of along the same lines if you think about it. It's all about the uncertainty of crypto in the long term. Now, we're all generating systems that we hope will be successful um, in the market and, and hopefully be around for a long time. And so go back, going back to my, my previous uh, diagram of worry, as, as I put it, um, as far as the longevity of data and the lifespan of the product, it really still does fit in you know, based on you know, what happens if there's um, quantum secure um, crypto um, or is required to be, to be retrofitted, or indeed if policies change uh, that require a, a change in standards based on, on new legal frameworks. So I'd ask you to question the importance of security of your customers, not only in getting the product out the door. Um, obviously, that's the, the first thing that we focus on. We need to have a working product. It needs to be working at performance. But also look at the lifetime of your product. Um, certainly, your, your product needs to be updatable uh, in the software system. Uh, that's usually the case. Even when it comes to firmware on products, it's important to have an update mechanism in order to, to update your firmware uh, once the product has been released. Um, been launched, but also the customer's data over the entire lifetime of your product. Data with long-term value needs to be protected more urgently. If you've got someone that's going to be using your products with you know, medical data, social security numbers, things that will hold long-term value, then really we, we look at the longevity of, of the data value over years and really we're in a place where we need to be um, concerned about that longevity of data in the case of a quantum um, you know, future where we could potentially have nation states, first of all, um, but also powerful uh, individuals having access to this kind of technology potentially in the future. Data with shorter term value, that may all be safe today. I mean, I'm not suggesting that you need to protect a, a, a short term cookie that, that has a, you know, a few tens of minutes of lifetime you know, with the same value of urgency as, as, as longer term value. But in the future, um, you may need to have um, changes in the steps to your product in securing that um, securing that data. Integrating uh, devices that have programmable logic in them, you know, devices such as FPGAs, can help you have more capacity in the future to adapt to change. Now, it could well be that um, you may already need some um, some hardware custom logic you know, based on the the hardware side of your design. But integrating that in such a way that you could potentially use that as an accelerator in the future, that gives you a bit of flexibility. You know, it's something that needs to be designed up front. You know, sometimes it's not always possible. Um, sometimes it will add uh, cost to your product. So the, these are things that shouldn't be taken lightly. But looking to have that um, future flexibility to update in the future as standards change, as new technologies come out that, that may well not be suitable um, directly to be running on your CPU, um, using a technology such as an FPGA could potentially give you some slack in order to, to be able to adapt in the future. So I hope you found that useful. Um, I'm going to switch screens now and have a look at um, any of the Q&A that may have come in uh, during the presentation. So bear with me for a moment. I'll just read through those and I'll, I'll see if there's any that I can address um, in the few minutes that we have remaining. OK, having a look at some of the uh, questions now. Uh, let's have a look here. Uh, I guess a few log logistical questions, first of all. Uh, so Andrew's asking about the, the slides. I will share them on the, the shed, so I'll, I'll get that sorted after this presentation. Um, and Victor was asking about um, whether this is going to be on demand at some point. I guess that's a question for the foundation. Uh, previous years, there have been um, on-demand versions um, sometime after the event. Um, so I know all of these are being recorded. So my understanding is that, that we are going to have that available. Uh, looking through now. Um, Question from Paolo. Paolo, um, what kind of encryption has the greatest strength to become the next post-quantum encryption standard, maybe Lattice? 
I think that's a an interesting question. Um, as as I showed on the slide, there's there's a number of different um, standards out there that that are being looked at. Um, Lattice being one of them, along with some others. It's really hard to tell um, which one's going to make it as the the standards or the the recommended uh, standards for for quantum secure. Um, I think a lot of them have some potentials right now. But as I said earlier in the presentation, um, it's not really until quite a lot of time has gone past that, that we see certain vulnerabilities in some cases. Um, I'm not suggesting that there are any, I, I don't know, um, but it, it could well be that that um, could take some out of the running or, or not. I was talking to a, um, a senior security architect as a, a multinational, um, quite a large multinational um, late last week, um, asking a similar question, you know, when do we expect there to be uh, standards for um, for this kind of um, technology and his thoughts were uh, around 2025 yeah that's when when they were planning on on having um, an expectation that there'd be some real standards on on quantum secure so we're probably uh, it seems like five years is a magic number but we seem to be five years out for, for that kind of thing and so he was talking a lot about the ability to be crypto agile so crypto agility is important certainly in the next five years as they um, as we move towards having uh, a standard. I've got a uh, question here from Laurent. Do you think, do you really think that we'll break uh, cryptography in five years time? I mean, really? Um, well, it's hard to tell. I mean, as, as I say, it's probably been at least five years since someone said um, that crypto could be broken in, in five years time. Um, we saw the NSA guidance of, uh, of one or two decades and maybe that's more um, of a realistic number, I, I'm not sure. But I think it's quite telling, not only hearing people in the press talking about this, but looking at the requirements of customers as they uh, build new designs. And so talking about that NSA um, scenario that I had in a previous slide, looking at their contractor requirements, uh, as I mentioned, that is now specifying some post-quantum um, secure algorithms. And so if the NSA are asking their contractors to look at it, then that's a, another data source that we can use to, to suggest that um, yeah, this, this could be on the horizon, at, at least for longer term. Got a question from Victor about Signal. Um, I guess one of the, I guess that's around the, the messaging side of things. So Signal is a great example of the, the horse having bolted the door. Um, so Signal is, is, is open source, it's available on all platforms. And so you can have um, true um, cryptographically secure connections with open source behind that um, and not really be at the beck and call of a particular government you know, banning a commercial product. Um, and so I think, Talking to the, the GCHQ uh, papers as well as um, some others, there's an acknowledgement that certain scenarios exist where strong crypto will always be available, um, you know, regardless of what policies a government has. And let's face it, a criminal is not going to um, necessarily follow the law when it comes to you know, banning of certain technologies. You know, that's, that's not how they work. But I think um, a lot of the conversations that are going on right now are really about um, policies and what can be done um, and you know what the governments want to do and so signal would be ruled out of that kind of thing I mean I guess Apple could ban it um, under the duress of the government but certainly any ability to sideload or, or use it on desktop PC you're never going to be able to stop that you know not without some major infrastructure changes at least Thanks, Pally, for the for the response back there. Um, let's just see if there are any others. Um, yeah, I had Kate with a similar question: How can governments change crypto when the software is already out? Hopefully, I've I've covered that. Okay. Um, yep. Yeah, I'll um, I'll uh, I'll be sure to um, to to join the Slack channel as well, um, and uh, I'll send the uh, responses to the message out in there. Um, so look forward to seeing you on the Embedded Linux track um, on Slack. Thank you everyone for your time. Um, I hope you enjoyed it um, and looking forward to hopefully presenting with you again sometime soon. Thank you.